I hope that everyone is having a great conference uh, so far. Uh, as I mentioned during the uh, opening keynote present panel discussion, I'm Jeff Corbin and I am senior advisor at StaffBase for Strategic Internal Communications Consulting. And today we are real excited and pleased to have uh, Mark Levy back. This is his second time at the Voices Conference. Um, after he received tremendous reviews, uh, we were like, you got to come back, Mark. Uh, so he's joining us today for a Q&A session where all of you um, will have the opportunity, as well as those who have already posed questions to, as the session uh, is called, Ask Mark Anything. Um, I'd like to share with you just a little bit about Mark's background. He is a seasoned, globally-minded employee experience leader who has chosen to work for big-hearted companies and focus on how he and his team can unleash the talents and passions of a company's employees. And most recently, Mark was the pioneer of designing the employee experience at Airbnb, we all know that company, um, which has since created significant changes in the way organizations globally are looking at expanding the HR function to focus on the entire employee journey. This scope included traditional HR functions in addition to broader teams focused on social impact, culture, and workplace. Uh, Mark helped to further Airbnb's mission, which is to create a world where you can belong anywhere. And he did this by establishing the employee experience mission that employees feel they belong to or belong at Airbnb. Um, one last accolade, uh, Mark was recognized by Glassdoor for his and his team's work by being named by them the number one place to work in 2016. So. Uh, Mark, welcome back to Voices. Thank you for having me back. Terrific. Um, let me advance the slide. Just give me one second here. Um, you know, employee experience, um, it means a lot of things to different people. Um, what I thought would be a good way to start the conversation off is maybe, Mark, you could spend some time uh, defining how you view employee experience and how uh, maybe we could touch on how it differs from employee communications, how employee communications and engagement fits in. Sure. So uh, welcome, everybody from around the world. Uh, when I started talking to staff base two years ago, the plan was to be in Berlin. Uh, last April, and unfortunately that didn't happen. Um, in the last session, I, I went through probably an hour or so of kind of the deep dive into employee experience. So it probably makes sense to at least on the, on the, on the high level end, kind of share with you my thoughts around what employee experience is, and then we can get into the questions, uh, some of which have been pre-submitted, and then those of you that are on are welcome to ask questions as well. So I mean, employee experience, um, really started with the opportunity when I joined Airbnb uh, to work with three big hearted founders who didn't really know what HR was, but everything they'd heard about it, they really didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, and so they asked me to really kind of rethink what is it, what is HR? How do we engage more big folks? How do we scale a culture that they defined and that was an amazing place for people to work? And so um, what my team and I did really was to, to create a different, broader approach to what was called HR. And there was a, a broader remit, uh, which included traditional HR uh, functions, but it also included things like mission values, internal comms, which is what many of you are doing, which was really the foundation of our employee experience approach. And that included employee events, celebration, um, and recognition. It included things like workplace, facilities, food, environments, safety and security, and included things like diversity, equity and inclusion, social impact, and wellness, which were kind of emerging seven years ago or so when, when I started. So broad real focus of employee experience is that um, it's a shift in mindset. And, and that shift really is a company-wide mindset shift to create this idea of employee experience. And Jeff, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, and that approach, that new approach is to 
um, treat your employees like you do your customers. And, and, and by that, and from an inter internal comms perspective, it really means you're thinking about not what your leaders want to share with their employees, but what is it the employees want to know about? How are they gonna most likely receive that information? And how do you create two-way dialogue so it's not a one-way um, situation? And so the kind of headline for me around um, employee experience is you're gonna do things with and for your employees, not to them. And if you go to the next slide, it all across the entire organization. As I said, it's not just an HR thing. So any function that's kind of touching the employee journey should be in service to the employee. So here I have marketing and, and probably an internal comm. Some of you might sit in marketing. Some of you might sit in HR or employee experience. Some of you might sit in a totally separate function called internal comms or comms. Um, and some of you might you know, directly report into the CEO. Regardless of where you sit, there are certain functions, including internal comms, that really need you to understand how you're in service to the employee and how you co-create and leverage your employees to help you to prioritize what's most important and to, and to create that two-way dialogue. And so the next slide is a, is a great cartoon I found. Um, and it's all about kind of this idea of listening and co-creating. And the cartoon's obviously a little bit old school there. And uh, what if I know this sounds crazy, we listen to our employees, but more that's what you need to do, particularly today and see under the pandemic and who knows what what's coming next and a lot of people working remotely. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the um, when we get to the questions. So that's kind of my overarching kind of definition and how I've seen uh, employee experience come to life relative to organization structure, kind of mindset shift and, and ways of working. Terrific. Um, as, as we mentioned, we had solicited uh, questions from attendees before the session just to be mindful of time and the fact that we have a lot, a lot of ground to cover. Um, basically, what we did was to divide the questions into kind of five neat categories. Um, so, you know, as you can see on this slide, a post-COVID world is one of the categories of questions that people were interested in learning about more in the context of employee experience. So um, in, in your view, um, how has employee experience changed since uh, we've all been plagued with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Um, obviously, up until recently, and the fact that the workplace has changed for the hopefully not foreseeable future, but at least right now. Um, so how, how, how have you seen employee experience change? Um, also, if you can touch on how employee communications fits into this. Certainly. Um, so I might start with the first one or the second one first, which is never before have employee communications been more important. Um, and I, I work with a number of companies and some of them are somewhat perfectionists and they didn't like to communicate, they didn't like to have all hands meetings unless they were all buttoned up and had all the answers. And I really had to convince them that the most important thing when we all had to move to remote working and there was so much uncertainty, which continues, is that you really need to communicate either shorter, more informal types of uh, communications and they need to have that two-way dialogue. They need to have the opportunity for employees to ask questions some companies have you know, put in a running FAQ, um, but the role of internal comms, the role of human resources during the pandemic has been basically the most important role in the company. Just like the most important role in the company back in the financial crisis was the CFO, now it really is HR and internal comms. Um, I'd say what I've seen about the employee experience is that all these things that I just talked about is the definition of, of, of employee experience have become more necessary, more important. Um, and the role of the manager, the individual manager has also elevated. Um, and and, I, and I, it's really because what, what, has have, what has had to happen is we really had to meet their employees where they are. Our employees in a way that we did before it used that people would come to work and they'd hopefully leave whatever it was that they had um, good, bad, and ugly at home. But now people are working from home or as, as I've said, 
people are now kind of living at work, however you want to define it, it's all melted together. And so what I've seen is that we really need to both understand our employees from an emotional level, where's their head at, how are they doing, as well as from a productivity or a you know, result-driven level. And that's led to the need to not have a one-size-fits-all approach. So again, relative to internal comms, this has meant that we've really had to figure out how do we have those all hands, but then how do we set up our, our leaders and our managers to both communicate and manage with their team, but also how do they communicate uh, and manage the individuals on their teams? Because some people or they were compromised or health and they're you know, freaked out and, and concerned and uh, really can, and needing some help and support relative to their safety. Some people are living alone, uh, which is causing a lot of loneliness and isolation. And some people are living with a lot of people and they're just trying to find a place to be able to quietly work or have some sanity. Um, some people are parents and now they've got to either do childcare or teach their kids. A lot of us have pets. We've got to figure out how we can um, get them out uh, for a walk and do what they need to do. And we have to take care of ourselves eating meals, staying healthy, even going to the bathroom. What I've seen is so many companies have gone to this ongoing Zoom uh, cycle that you just don't have the opportunity to even have a moment to breathe, let alone to deal with your own situation. So um, relative to employee experience, it really has ratcheted for your employees. Ask them how they're doing. Have them be part of what is it going to take for them to be successful at home a lot of companies have started to put in place uh, uh, either a monthly stipend or an initial stipend to set up their home working space. And then you've had to really learn how to use technology um, to help create connections. So whether that's Slack or whether that's, you know, there's a community uh, uh, vendor partner out there called Mixer that helps to create communities um, and try to get the noise out of the email and also remind people that uh, they can pick up the phone and talk to each other and just find ways to continue the connections that they had before this all happened. But it needs to be more intentional. Um, and so really quickly, kind of those connections are the employee and the company, which I've talked about, the employees with each other. So finding ways, but also the friends that you had in the normal ways that you were able to make connections in the company. So a lot of internal comms organizations have tried to take the things that were um, offline and put them online, whether that's fireside chats or employee resource groups or running clubs or some of the fun. How do you, how do you bring people back together to be able to do that? And then um, how do you create connections between employees and the customer? Um, that could get lost if, if you're kind of a service organization um, and then finally, how do you continue to create connections between employees and the communities in which you operate? Many companies are focused on the community through volunteerism or other things. And, and how do you find ways to keep that connection going through the remote working situation? So um, sorry, that was a long answer, but I think employee experience has never been more important. And I think internal comms is front and center to figure out how to get to them and them feel connected at a time when we're, when we're all separated. Great, so one of the things that you said that really resonated with me was that the fact that given the current state of the world, um, employee experience, employee communications has never been more important. Um, this kind of takes us right into the next question of, uh, the C-suite buy-in and also money and budget. Um, because unfortunately, um, employee communications experience, not necessarily in all organizations, but in many organizations don't have the, the big budgets that other uh, business units in the organization have. So um, we all know that if an initiative is supported by the, the chief executive, then everyone is going to listen and follow along hopefully uh, uh, in, in agreement with, uh, with the initiative. Um, unfortunately, areas like employee experience, engagement, communications aren't always going to be, or are always aren't front and center in an organization's priorities. Um, 
what are your thoughts on this? Um, how did you do what you did at Airbnb? And you know, what is the best way to prove value and ROI with respect to these sort of initiatives to secure uh, the budgets that are necessary? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna answer the question around kind of getting C-suite buy-in and then I'll talk a little bit about money and budget. Um, I think that there was a lot of skeptic before the pandemic uh, as to whether or not employees could successfully work from home or work remotely. And when the pandemic hit, there was no choice but to have people no longer come into the office and work. A lot of those skeptics, people who might have had um, a bad taste in their mouth or a lack of trust for their employees prior to the pandemic have become believers. And so I think to some extent, the pandemic has helped to overcome the issues and challenges that um, some CEOs or business leaders had around doing more of co-creation and involving employees more in creating the workplace and helping to prioritize because what they saw was that it worked. Um, what they saw was that people were in many cases, in most cases, actually working more than they did before. Um, and so that's kind of an unintended consequence or, or making lemonades, lemonade out of lemons. Um, typically, what I've also talked about relative to getting the CEO on board is that it really helps the head of HR who might have like they needed to have all the answers or uh, we're fearful, fearful of an entitled workplace. Um, it helps them to ask questions and have more information. A lot of companies were getting information via engagement surveys or pulse surveys, sometimes Q and A's. But when you have more information, it helps you make better decisions around what, where you should be putting your money and what you should be talking about and what your employees need to successfully deliver on the company's promise and to deliver to the customers. And so um, I have found that um, it's almost a relief to CEOs and to heads of HR that they don't have to have all the answers and that um, by moving to this way of working that you actually have a lot more input and a lot more in information and data to be able to make better decisions versus in the right place. Um, Relative to the budget, I would say two things. One is, I don't, I don't believe that employee experience means that you have to spend more money. A lot of times what it meant was that you took budgets that were in other parts of the organization and you put them into employee experience. So for example, facilities. Um, a lot of times that sat under real estate and they were spending money, but it wasn't spending money in a way that was benefiting the employee. And, and if you brought it over and you were asking more questions around how do you like to work and, and you find that people want to be able to sit or they want to be able to stand or there was ergonomic issues or um, they weren't sitting next to the right people to get their jobs done, all that information was helping you to use the money that you had in a better way because you were more thoughtful and more closer to where the problem The thing that's going on with the pandemic is a lot of companies spend a lot of money on on their facilities, on food or on safety and security or those things that were being spent to open up and to have a welcoming and a functional workplace. That money, a lot of it, is not being spent right now. And so what I've been talking to a lot of my clients about and, and have been hearing from other um, HR leaders is how do we thoughtfully take that budget and figure out, particularly if the company's not doing well, how do we save some of that? But how do we redeploy that towards, you know, stipends for employees to, to be able to get a better chair or to upgrade their Wi-Fi? Or a lot of companies are actually looking at, at companies like Staffbase to say, you know, I didn't ever invest in an internal comm strategy and a way to connect better with my employees. More than ever, this is something you know, kind of struggled with where we're going to get the money. But now I can take it from my budget that was around food or facilities or safety and security 
because I don't have employees in right now. And it's much better spent in a way to create those connections and to share and inform uh, employees. And so I think, you know, we have to think more creatively. We have to kind of um, ask our employees what they need. And then we have to take a look at what we are spending and what we have and figure out better ways to, to manage that under the circumstances. And, and then figure out what does that mean kind of going forward, which I think is the question later on. In, in exactly. Talking. Can you maybe touch uh, quickly on what you, how, how you at Airbnb went about, um, you know, you, you started something from, from that was brand new. What was you right. know, were your challenges in making the case? How did you go about getting the budgets that you needed? Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one, the CEO and the founders were very much around um, a lack of bureaucracy. Um, if, if you had information and you had expertise, then you could be in a meeting as long as you could have value with not very hierarchy. Um, and, and so can we started from a place of employees being involved? But um, there were some skeptics that I had to deal with in, in the company. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you say, well, find people that are interested in what you're doing and then make them advocates. And then if you build it, they will come. And, and that worked in some of the things that we did. But if I think about a victory that we had there, um, we had a head of engineering who felt like we should be building everything ourselves, including employee experience um, technology. And so, and nobody liked our performance management. I decided to engage with him to understand this notion of employee experience. And so we did some RFPs, we looked at different vendors and we got some of his leaders involved in working with us to redefine the process, but also to see what was out there relative to vendors. And he was amazed by how much thought people had put into this and how great the technology was and how it overlaid on our own technology. And so he ended up becoming an advocate rather than a skeptic around this idea of employee experience. And we co-created with he and his team to then build our performance management process and to bring in a performance management vendor. So that was, that was a great way um, to overcome this idea or, or some lack of appreciation for what we were trying to do. On the budget side of things, I think it was more because I was cobbling together this notion of employee experience. Um, I didn't ask for more money. I just brought over air to help us create a better employee. So in the beginning, I actually had real estate and facilities. I had the entire food program. And that was a huge budget, but it wasn't an increase in the budget to what was there before. It was just putting it all in one place to manage it through this lens of employee experience and have it being spent in a more employee-centric way. Great, great. All right, let's move on to the next question. I'm just, again, being mindful of time. Um, it's kind of an extension of what we were just talking about. Um, so a new initiative like employee experience or a new technology solution, um, it's given the green light. Um, but you find that there are folks that you know, just aren't embracing it. And we all know human nature is not to want to do new things. Um, so, you know, given that set of circumstances, you know, what's your experience? How do you get employees who often are adverse to change to support uh, new initiatives um, like it, it, yeah. employee experience initiatives? Yeah, so again, I don't want to sound kind of Pollyannish or overly optimistic, but my what I found was that when you get employees involved in something that they care about, they're going to help you to make better choices. So I'll give you an example. And typically I show a video um, where we actually won a CAN uh, design award for the work that we did in reimagining our Portland call center. And in that video, it shows what we did, which was we started by talking to our employees and saying, what are the ways in which you like to work? And we found that some like to sit at a dedicated desk, some like to stand, some like to sit in open spaces, um, but they all like to move around. Um, and so using workshops and using service, we found out through our employees 
what they wanted from a new a workplace. And essentially they wanted a place that felt like home, but had the functionality of work. And, and through this way of co-creating with them, we ended up building a, a new location for 150 people that because they built it, they were proud of it. In fact, if we went so far as to let them choose listings from around the world that inspired them, and then they got to get a budget and build out some of the meeting rooms that were Amsterdam or Copenhagen or um, Jamaica. Um, and they, they had ownership in building out not only what this place is gonna look like, but actually some of the meeting rooms. And by including them in those conversations, we had um, people who were involved and then we had people who, who said, oh, that looks amazing, I want in on that. The opportunity not drawings in, but to do things with and for, and then people came along with us. The other thing we did was, you know, in this idea of um, co-creation um, or human-centered design or agile, some call it, it's around not doing something and then just assuming you fixed it. It's around having a lot of iteration and prototyping and version. So just like on your iPhone, it's very natural for you to get an update. You know, you just do that the next day you wake up and there's new functionality. A lot of what we did in employee experience was the same thing with, okay, we put in this new performance management process, but you know what? We found out from you through this mid-year review process that the 360 didn't work because of X, Y, or Z. So we're gonna change that and next time we'll do it a little bit differently. So when you move to this idea of having your employees, basically thinking of them like customers and having them give you feedback and then change and having that be iterative, again, you lose skeptics from saying, those people in HR, they don't know what they're doing. Internal comms is talking about stuff I don't care about. You don't have that anymore because you're having the two-way dialogue and, and the input that they're giving you is how you're then managing what it is you're doing and how right, you're Right, and you know, one of the things that um, you, you made me start to think, um, you know, many organizations, their leadership talks about transformation um, and how, you know, the organization is gonna change. At the end of the day, it's not necessarily, transformation isn't, it's gonna be driven by the C-suite, but at the end of the day, it's really gonna be the employees who are the ones who need to be empowered to um, actually affect any sort of transformation. So involving them the way you just suggested makes, makes a whole lot of sense. Um, let's go to our next question. Um, this is one that I'm sure many in our audience um, think about a lot, um, maybe shudder a bit. Um, I, I, you know, <laughs> the relationship with IT. Um, in my work consulting uh, with companies as they implement new technological solutions, I've seen organizations where IT, communications, and HR really work in partnership. And, and when that happens, new solutions, new initiatives tend to move really quickly and successfully. Um, Unfortunately, that's not always the case in many organizations that I've seen. IT sits completely separate from uh, from communications and IR. So, you know, what has your experience been, and any advice uh, for those who don't have a partnership or even a good working relationship with IT? Yeah, um, it's funny when Jeff and I were preparing, and this question came up. Um, this is actually an example that I that I typically use as well. Um, adjacent functions to HR when it comes to delivering a seamless employee experience. Um, and so we actually, I don't, I'm not going to advocate that you go out and you replace your IT lead, but we had the opportunity to do that when I got to, to Airbnb. And when we brought in uh, Mike Jennings, who uh, was leading the organization, he was amazing because he came from a very much a your employee is your customer perspective. And we had some cleaning up to do because IT before that was a bit bureaucratic, particularly for a small company. And, and Mike's approach was very much one of customer centricity. And he and I looked at the Genius Bar um, approach to how Apple focuses and, and helps their customers. And he basically deployed that across the organization. And what, what he did was he actually physically set up Genius Bars in each of our locations. Um, 
at the Genius Bar, and a lot of them were from back. And he coached and trained them to see the employees as their customer. And he got rid of all the red tape, so there was no forms to fill out or accounts, you know, to have to um, complete or give the numbers or even manager approval. If you went to the genius to the um, IT to the IT bar and you had a problem whether it was software or whether it was hardware, first of all, no question was stupid. So they kind of made you feel like they were there to help. And then if you needed an adapter to go to another country or you needed an iPad because you were traveling, all of that was there in the back room available to you. And the assumption was, we're here to help you do your job better. And that mindset shift and the way that they changed their processes and had availability of product really was a game changer. And it was the, through this notion of doing things with and for your employees, what they needed, and then treating them like that helped change the whole shift of the IT function. Great. Um, just as a reminder for those of you who are in this breakout session, if you do have questions that you want to ask of Mark, um, use the uh, the chat function. Um, and if we have time, we'll definitely get to them. Uh, the future. Wow, that's a that's a big question. Um, you 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 started something from scratch. Um, you obviously are like I mentioned when I introduced you, the pioneer when it comes to uh, employee experience. Um, what does the crystal ball of Mark Levy show for the next five years? You know what what should we expect, um, both you know philosophically, big picture, and you know what should we as communications professionals um, be thinking about in terms of how we take advantage of that? Um, well, my crystal ball is a little foggy. I think everyone's is right now. Um, but here's here's what I would say. Um, Josh Burson, who's an amazing um, HR practitioner and and has tons of data and a lot of analytics and um, huge uh, following, um, he talked kind of early on during the pandemic around this being the big reset. And he talked about a number of things, um, including the important role of the manager, the important role of looking at people's emotional state and who they are before you can expect them to deliver. Um, and I'm hoping that a lot of companies and a lot of HR leaders and a lot of internal comms leaders are seeing what worked well, what do we learn from what's gone on the last six months? And knowing that it's not going to turn back on a dime and knowing that we shouldn't go back. Because there's so much interesting data and so much um, new ways that we can think about work and life that mm -hmm. didn't exist that kind of forced us into this hopefully open mind. And so I guess that my crystal ball would say that um, I'm hoping we're going to uh, move to a more fluid uh, way of working where there are still offices because I do think there's a lot of good in bringing people together. I mean, Airbnb was around creating belonging and belonging happens when people create connections. And I think a lot of that does still need to be in person. But I do think that the, the office of the future is going to be a place for community. It's going to be a place for collaboration and it's going to be a place for learning. I don't think it needs to be a place where you have to commute every day and sit at a desk and, you know, kind of be at home. I think there's ways that companies can be a lot more intelligent around how to bring people together um, that um, is respectful of their time and helps to create connections, whether they're informal connections. So, for example, whether it's an employee resource group meeting, um, or whether it's the you know French you know club meeting, or whether it's the cross-functional team that's focused on um, homes or experiences coming to meet, or the finance organization, um, or having all hands, um, or doing management training. I think there's so many great reasons to bring people back together, but I'm hoping that we also understand and recognize and allow people to be able to work from home or work remotely because you can be a lot more productive. I mean, the data tells us that the average employee is putting in um, 
at least three more hours a week than the more aggressive or hardworking, probably putting in five or six. I think part of what we also need to do is put in boundaries and ways in which we encourage our employees to be their best selves and to create an opportunity for people to take care of themselves, take care of their loved ones in a way where we're also not just so blending it that it does feel like you're living at work instead of working from home. But my future tells me we're going to learn from this and we're going to find ways. And hopefully it also is going to be that this idea of employee experience where there were people who were skeptical about it are going to see the benefits of listening to our employees, of including our employees, of co-creating with our employees. And internal comms leaders are going to see the benefits of no longer doing one size fits all. There's obviously ways you need to communicate across the organization, but really looking at your employees in segments, just like your marketing people look at customers in segments of technology like staff base to be your employees where they are and to be able to cut through the noise so that employees can both get their work done but also have the information they need around things that are important to them and, and to create connections and that means to other employees or to the customer. So, I, I'm optimistic so long as we learn from what went well and what didn't, and we just don't go, you know, yearning back to the old days of everyone being in an office and, and not being more thoughtful around why you're coming to work and what work is about. Totally agree. And, and hopefully it's these kinds of conversations that um, will empower the professionals that are attending to go back to their organizations, whether it's virtually or in person and to, you know, to, to say, let's, let's remember what we've just experienced and let's not fall back in our old ways, but take advantage of it. So uh, we do have a question. Yeah. It's obviously, and you know, who knows what's gonna happen when winter comes and um, whatnot. And so I think people should be more, less focused on when are we getting back to the office? and more focused on how do we continue to iterate on what's working and what's not working, and how do we strategically start to think about when we do have the opportunity, what's that gonna be like and let's start planning for it, but not, not towards the deadline of a date, but to do it more intentionally and thoughtfully. Totally agree. Uh, we do have yeah. a question that came in from Andrew Blunt, um, and he asks of you, Mark, what's the biggest mistake organizations make when trying to increase employee engagement? What's the one thing that everyone should be doing, but that they aren't? Okay. I would say the, probably the biggest mistake that I've seen is that people um, over-promise and under-deliver. Um, so, I mean, I think what, what, what happens is like, for example, when I am working with clients, I don't suggest you go out and say, big announcement, we're moving to employee experience. We're going to now ask you what you want and you're going to be involved. I always suggest that the companies start to behave this way and have people go, wow, things are kind of a little different around here. And I appreciate the fact that I'm being asked. And then you get to a place where you say, oh, that's because we've started to operate in this way that we call employee experience now. Um, and, and I think that what, what is the hard thing for people to do is if you all of a sudden say, we're gonna ask you what you want, if you don't couch that in, it doesn't mean we're gonna do what you say, um, then people feel like they've been let down. So typically, we, when we talked about transparency and we talked about employee experience, we basically said, we want to know what you want, which will help you. We need to understand we have limitations. We have financial limitations. We have resource limitations. And we got a lot of people. And we can't make everyone happy. But what we want you to know when we commit to is that you're, if you're interested, we're going to listen to what you have to say, and we're either going to... Um, approach things in a different way, or we're gonna share with you why we couldn't do what you wanted us to do. And we're gonna share with you what people have said, and we're gonna tell you what we're doing and how we got there. So you do need to increase and, and continue to be transparent, but you can't make promises that you can't keep and you shouldn't under promise, um, or you shouldn't over promise and under deliver. 
Great. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really the the old uh, expression of you know managing expectations and you know setting setting yeah. goals that are well articulated, um, that everyone understands, and that are also achievable. Um, because otherwise yeah. you set yourself up for uh, for not succeeding. Um, terrific. Well, um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, if there's any other questions, we can certainly take one more. Um, so I'll just keep an eye on the uh, on the chat. Um, Mark, is there anything that you would want to, you know, in, you know, in, in uh, leaving this discussion, would want to, you know, impress upon the people that um, joined us today? Yeah, I guess the, the one thing that I would say, and I've seen it with the pandemic, I've seen it with the George Floyd murder and the and the issues that have come out around systemic racism. Um, it is that um, we really need to be quite thoughtful around how we engage our employees at the right time um, and how we think about making sure that what we're saying and what we're doing is authentic. Authentic to the mission and values of the organization and authentic to um, what the employee's sentiment is and the authentic to uh, the brand promise or the promise to the customer and connecting the internal promise and the external promise um, and making sure that you're not, again, making promises you can't keep or saying things just because it seems like the right thing to do with nothing behind it. People sniff out bullshit really quickly, both, both people externally and also um, your employees. A lot of what I've seen during this whole situation is that companies have gone out and said things and then employees have come back and said, that's not how it is here. That's not how I feel treated. That's not how you're treating us. And so I think you need to be really careful about what you're proclaiming and make sure that it is true and make sure that it's authentic. And I think as internal comms people, you know, you really have to do the sniff um, where things aren't well received, where they're not true, where they're not substantiated, and they're not accurate. Because otherwise, you're going to be in a world of hurt. For sure. Um, and certainly now um, we have the, the tools uh, available to us to be able to make sure that we do deliver on what you just said. Um, awesome. Well, Mark, thank you so so much for uh, for joining us. This was this was really amazing. I'm sure it's being recorded so that everyone can, you know, uh, listen in in the um, after the after the event and to hear uh, what you had to say. So thank you very very much. Really really amazing. And I look forward to look forward to, to, to continue the conversation with you. Yeah. Wish everyone a great day, great evening. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay safe. Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your conference.